Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation, on the Land of Israel Network. It is May 12, 2020, the 18th day of the year, 5780, and a day that's known as Lag Baomer, or the 33rd day in the Omer, in the 49th day time period that we're counting between the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, or more commonly known as between the second day of Passover until Shavuot. So um, it, this show is not going to have an interview. Um, the last, wow, the last few months, I have been interviewing people, and I did try to get an interview today, actually having to do with Lagba Omer, kind of half-hearted, because I've got all these thoughts like roiling around in my head, mental meanderings, if you will. Uh, Eve's pandemic peeves, I suppose, could be another name. But there's just a lot of stuff that I kind of wanted to talk about in no particular order of importance. So I figured that I would take the opportunity to do that today. What's so interesting about Lag Baomer is, well, of course, it's different this year because everything is different this year. Usually, we would be uh, coughing today in Israel. Um, there is a, uh, I mean, hag, there is a ritual or a custom um, to light bonfires um, for reasons that are not so clear, some people say because of the mystical, fiery element of the day, and other people say because that's what the marshmallow manufacturers want us to do. Um, but there is a very big uh, custom to do that, to light bonfires, for a lot of reasons, again, and I, I don't, the show's not going to be about Lag Balmer, I just wanted to give a little preliminary about why I'm in the top floor of my house, look in my son's room, because I miss him, and so by broadcasting, by sitting here, where I don't need to have great internet as I do with I'm on Zoom. Not that I have great internet, even when I'm on Zoom, as some of you know, because the, the interviews have cut out sometimes, uh, and it's really frustrating. But just as an aside, because that's how this show is going to be, everything's going to be an aside, I can't get the cord from my computer so that I can plug it directly into my Wi-Fi box. I have a not-so-new MacBook Air and I've been like calling around because obviously like a lot of the Apple stores are closed and a lot of the people that have the Apple products are out of that or maybe never had it because it's old. Anyway, I can't get that cord. And so I think it's called a Thunderbolt. If any of you out there listening to this happen to deal with Apple products, let me know, please. Anyway, I love my Mac stuff. This is not a plug for Apple. Um, it's just that I, it was my first computer way back in the day in the 80s. And then we went on to the usual things. And then a few years ago, I came back to Apple and I love them also because they all sync together, but you don't find them so much in Israel, much more popular outside of Israel. And so I can't get the cord and that's why I'm sitting in my son's room today just doing a podcast on my task cam where I don't need internet and I'm looking out the window. I, there's a point to all this. I'm looking out the window and um, A, I can see Jordan or the mountains of Moab from here because uh, it's just a little bit higher than the mountain ridge looking over uh, the eastern Gush Etzion. And I can see across the rift. Um, as a matter of fact, I can see the two tall skinny towers that are Amman. So that's like pretty wild. But why can I see them this morning? Because normally on Lag Bomer morning, you can't see nothing because the bonfires of last night fill the air with a tremendous amount of smoke. So as we've had for the last few years and the world recovering, maybe the environment recovering a little bit from all the junk that we throw into her all the time. So on a personal level here in Israel, um, because of the limitations on gatherings, uh, which some people, of course, didn't listen to, which is a whole other issue that maybe I'll get into later. Um, we didn't have the bonfires. All right. There are normally hundreds of thousands of people who go up to Meron, which is just outside of Tzfat and really kind of the cradle of Kabbalah and of mystical Judaism uh, from way back when. The reason they do that is because of the Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, this is apparently the um, and commemoration of his passing. And he is known for many things. One of them, which is controversial, it's not clear if he did it and everybody agrees, is writing the Zohar, the underpinnings of mystical, uh, of Kabbalistic mystical Judaism. He also famously hid from the Romans. He lived during the second century when the Romans were all about. And, uh, and he hid from the Romans who were killing the rabbis who were teaching Torah. So he was isolated for seven years in a cave. 
uh, eating just carobs, which uh, is totally not chocolate. I had amazing chocolate last week. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Carobs is not chocolate. But anyhow, um, that there's a lot of stories about him. And now I was like thinking about him in a different way. I was like, seven years. Like that's a, that's a long time. And here we are, some of us going crazy after seven weeks, right? And in a lot different situation than he had. I assume that nobody listening to this is living in a cave uh, and, uh, and having to eat just carobs. So A, we need to appreciate the good even within the difficult situation. But uh, like that's that's got to change you, right? So maybe it changed him in the positive sense of him being able to connect more to the creator and be able to really get into the secrets of mystical Judaism, which would be the idea. But, um, but I don't know, make, does that, like maybe he was like just a little bit crabby when he got out. And there's also stories of that, right? Like maybe his social skills uh, weren't what they should be, which also makes sense if you're not really with people for a long time. He was also a brilliant, apparently, according to legend, he was also a brilliant scientist. Um, he knew botany. Many, 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 many of the rabbis in the ancient world, unfortunately, not as many as there should be in this world where science has kind of been shunted aside. But I think, and I've talked about this before, I think anything having to do with science, biology, physics, chemistry, all that can be shown and learned as God's world. I mean, who came up with all those rules? But anyhow, he was apparently a brilliant botanist. And um, when the Jews were asked to move in Tiberias, which had been started um, uh, by Herod the Great's, one of his sons, Herod Antipas, in the first century, the Jews didn't want to move there because there were um, graves all over the place and Jews don't live where there are graves. Very big separation between life and death. But he apparently um, was able to find where the graves were and purify the area, dig up the bones by planting lupines, the beautiful flower, and because they grow off of organic material. So very interesting person, as most people are, um, not, you know, not, can't be boxed in. And so one of the reasons for um, celebrating Lagba Omer is to commemorate his death, but really when we commemorate somebody's death, we're commemorating their life, at least in Judaism, that's how we do it. It also is apparently a break in the plague. Yes, I will say that again, a break in the plague that Rabbi Akiva, as they say, that 24,000 of Rabbi Akiva, who's the teacher of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and who himself is uh, killed by the Romans, most likely in, in Caesarea and in Caesarea in the theater there, um, the oh, at the time probably amphitheater there uh, in front of uh, is tortured for te- for refusing to stop teaching Torah, dies saying Shema Yisrael, which is one of the reasons it's become the the what you want to say if you can uh, as you take your last breaths and and you know tortured and really an incredible man Rabbi Akiva, but not to get it too much into Rabbi Akiva, but they say that his students didn't speak nicely to each other and therefore. Um, Many of them died during this time period of the Omer back in the second century, and there was a break in that uh, on this day. And there are others who put it more in a kind of political reference and say that his students were fighting in the Bar Kokhba revolt. And we also, although it's a little bit looser, and I and I did a show a few years ago, some of you might remember, with um, with uh, Doron Saravi, a uh, professor here in Israel who's one of the experts on the Bar Kokhba revolt and on Bar Kokhba fascinating individual. Um, and so those who say that actually students, uh, what had happened is their deaths are dying in, as soldiers in the Bar Kokhba revolt. So you can kind of see how this whole day can be um, tweaked according to what your agenda is. So if I'm not, I'm using agenda in a positive sense here uh, to a great degree, you know, if you want to focus on the spiritual aspect and also a lot of people, this is when they cut their son's hair, people who have their son's hair grow until they're three. This is the day where you do the chalakeh or upshirin as it's known, uh, the Yiddish word. And, and so you find normally up in Meron and up near Tzvat um, carpeted, just the hills carpeted with hundreds of thousands of people wielding scissors and uh, and cutting their son's hair for the first time. So there's a whole lot of different rituals and different ideas that kind of fall in on today. The Bar Kokhba one is probably the shakiest to a great degree. 
uh, the connection with Bar Kokhba here and shooting arrows. Like I said, there's a whole lot of stuff, but that is a few shows in and of itself. And that's not really what I, I want to focus on today. Although it's interesting for me because where I live in Judea, where I live in Gush Etzion, was the heart of the Bar Kokhba revolt, Herodian, which I can see uh, when I leave my house. I can't see it from here. I saw, got to see a glimpse of it yesterday, is the headquarters of the Bar Kokhba revolt. And a lot of what's going around here has to do with the Bar Kokhba revolt. But I'm mentioning it also because yesterday, um, the Israel Antiquities Authority and City of David announced that a coin had been found. It wasn't found yesterday. A lot of times things that are found in the digs are they wait to announce them close to a holiday that has to do with what was found to give it like an extra boost. I remember a few years ago after they found a little ostraca, a little like um, clay piece in one of the tunnels in the city of David that says Bethlehem on it. Apparently the only time that Bethlehem was found, like written obviously outside the Bible, and they announced that on the eve of Shavuot, which is, uh, all, which I'm, and I'm staring at Bethlehem right now outside my window, the real Bethlehem, um, because of course we read the book of Ruth and that has to do with the genealogy of King David and of tremendous social kindness and the wheat fields and the barley fields and all that outside of Bethlehem, which means Beit Lechem, which means house of bread. So the whole thing kind of like fits together. So they announced the Bar Kokhba coin, which is a very interesting find. A, it was found in a real dig. A lot of, we have huge problems here, huge, with robbery. It's another show that I plan on doing in the future. Um, with robbery of our uh, uh, ancient archaeological sites, obviously, an archaeological site is going to be somewhat ancient. Um, and uh, a lot of these coins are found and make their way to the black market. And once they're taken out of you know, not in situ, once they're not found in the site, then, yeah, if you have the same thing that was found in a controlled dig, then you can make a very, very, very educated guess that this is from that time period, but it loses, you know, other things lose the historical relevance. So it's very important. This was found outside the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And um, what makes it unusual, it's, it's a coin from the second year of the Bar Kokhba revolt, and you can go online and read more about it. Um, it, and it has uh, a palm tree on one side and uh, grapes, a bunch of grapes on the other. But um, what's unusual about it is it says Jerusalem, and only four coins um, have been found uh, have in Jerusalem. Out of 22,000 coins that have been found in Jerusalem, only four have been found from Bar Kokhba. There's another 20 that were found in Europe um, of, of also from this time. Um, and so what does this mean? Well, um, we've got the Romans are here, the legions are here. And, uh, what the feeling is also about the ones found in Jerusalem is that these are coins that the Roman soldiers had and then took with them and dropped out of their pocket. Uh, and, and that's the way, cause the legions eventually go back to what we know, now know today as Europe and also go into Jerusalem. 10th Legion especially sits in Jerusalem for like 200 years um, because Bar Kokhba did not make it into Jerusalem. They're, they never were able to, um, to reconquer Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, which was uh, the main thrust of what they were doing starting in 132, ending in, in 135 um, because Jerusalem was being turned into a pagan city by Hadrian. And so there's a whole lot of history here and a whole lot of different personalities. You know, was Bar Kokhba a good guy? Was he a bad guy? Uh, Rabbi Akiva obviously felt that he had some tremendous merit to him enough that he might have even been the Messiah, which is also why the Christians at the time, Christianity is just getting off the ground, do not participate in the Bar Kokhba revolt because hey, their Messiah's already come, so why would we think that Bar Kokhba is Messiah? And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and there are others, especially the rabbis, who scathe in criticism of him, um, be mainly because the revolt ends with tremendous devastation and hundreds of thousands of Jews being killed and the land really being devastated. My area then is emptied, is ethnically cleansed of Jews for hundreds of years. Jewish life goes up to the Galilee and to the Golan, um, for hundreds of years until about the, the 
you know, the end of, well, for a lot of different reasons, the massive earthquake in 749, the Islamic conquest, also a little bit earlier in the 7th century, and apparently climate change and plagues and some, whatever form of global warning, global warming took place then. I prefer to call it climate change. Sorry if you're a Democrat, but that's the way it goes here. These are things that do happen in cycles and famines and droughts and the usual things that devastate a world. Um, and that we can maybe have a little more, I don't know, sympathy for, but definitely understand more when we're living now in a time period where this unseen uh, so, and very difficult to fight against virus is devastating much of the world, uh, not necessarily in the numbers of dead, please God, it should remain that way. Uh, many, many people have died, but it's not, you know, the millions and millions that were predicted at the beginning, but who knows, it still could be. Because we don't know if there'll be another wave and we don't know what's going on here. And so um, when we look back at our history and, you know, a lot of people have been talking about different plagues and different things that happened that just knocked out like 30 percent of humanity at the time. Um, but when it comes to like learning his, the history here of the land of Israel, which is, of course, what I love to do, um, then you see how these things happen in waves. Anyhow, so the Jews go up and they're mainly in the Galilee and the Golan, a little bit down in the southern Hebron Hills. I'll talk about it in a minute because I was just there last week and um, and uh, and out of this area for a long time. So it's uh, it's even a greater feeling to be here and to, you know, be able just a few minutes out of Jerusalem and being able to we have reestablished life in this so incredibly um, important time of, uh, you know, of, of sovereignty and the Jews um, coming back home. Uh, I, as many of you know, I dislike the, we were gone for 2000 years because we were not gone for 2000 years. There were, have always Jews been living in the land. Always, 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 always. But we haven't had sovereignty and political power um, since really Bar Kochba revolt where he carved out a little state of Judea here. And of course, there's a lot of questions that come about this here also having to do with our modern world, which is, well, when do you rebel or at least say no to a higher authority? right? Because that's what was happening here. You look back and you're like, what are you out of your mind? Were you rebelling against the Roman Empire, strongest empire in the world at the time? And there are some people who say, well, then we shouldn't be doing it now either. We shouldn't be um, upsetting the United States. We shouldn't be upsetting the European Union and maybe the plans that are, we have to apply Israeli law in Judea and Samaria and, and you know, other areas like we shouldn't be doing that now. So where is that balance here? And, and, you know, how strong are you? And, and can, you, can you do that? And, and if you're wrong, the price to be paid is tremendous. So these are the same ideas, and there, there aren't clear answers. And that's, that's I think, what's um, so confounding when you, when you look at history, and specifically Jewish history, is there are very, very few situations where it's really clear that they should have done A instead of B. I mean, yes, you can look into the Bible. You can say, okay, well, that was a bad move. Like, you know, making the golden calf was probably not the way to go, um, right? Like, you know, so the Bible tends to present its case more black and white. But when we leave that time period, and that time period happened a long time ago, and we start getting into the period um, where we don't have prophets, and we don't have, uh, like, you know, the biblical record, and the great people of that time, then it starts getting a little bit muddier. And I think the Bar Kokhba revolt is a classic example of that. Um, and the way the rabbis write about it afterwards, again, is like, no, 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 and no. Um, but perhaps that has infiltrated its way a little too much into our psyche now, where we are still kind of trying to lay low and trying to not make problems and just like, excuse me for living. And we should be holding up our heads and saying, no, you know, if we're back in Israel and we are a, a country among others, that also gives us the right to make our own decisions about our future because we're going to pay the price if decisions or, or things, situations are foisted upon us that are not good. And when we have reason to, let's say, have a certain lack of trust in other countries <clears throat> and their ideas about what we should be doing here. So like, it's really, really, really hard to listen to the European Union. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I don't. I'm not coughing. That is allergies and, uh, 
in early morning, whatever. Um, but when the European Union or France or all these other countries are trying to say, no, 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 you know, you need to create a Palestinian state. And we're like, okay, guys, um, you, you just really care about our future, right? Uh, and you want the Jewish people to survive. So we also have to take that with a little bit of looking back and wondering what their agenda is and not necessarily falling into something which we have over the past many, many decades of maybe being um, too afraid of other people's opinions and not doing what's best for us. So um, I've already kind of like slipped down the that slope into talking about politics. So I will say that I am a little bit torn when it comes to Yamina, which is the party that I voted for, Naftali Bennett, Ayala Chaked, Bitsal Smutrich, etc. Because um, it looks like they're not going into the next government. And on the one hand, I understand why um, it looks like the prime minister is just humiliating them as much as he possibly can, not offering any kind of ministry that has really any kind of teeth. While during this these last few months, it seems like the Yamina ministers have done a good job from what I'm reading. And I don't just read uh, the articles that make me comfortable, like in Makor Rishon or other sources where I know that journalism is the way I would like journalism to be and doesn't have like this tremendous left-wing tilt. Um, but I also do read cer- certain things in Haaretz, uh, bleh, but yeah, not the editorials, but a lot of the other things that are given over there um, because I think it's important to try and get make my own decision and try and get balanced views from different places. And it seems like Bitsal Smutrich is very well thought of that what he's done in the last few months in the transportation ministry has earned him the respect of a lot of people that he was working with. Fascinating article a couple of weeks ago about how the, how, because we haven't, we've been home. So they've been able to really move on the train systems and a lot of the road works because people haven't been there and they've been working like crazy and things are going to even end up on schedule. But they said he's really worked well, someone who didn't have a background in that. And he's really, really gotten in there and made the most of his time. Of course, that's a ministry that he's going to lose. Um, and that I'm, I mean, I'm happy with how Naftali Bennett did in the, um, in the defense ministry and, and how, uh, not just how it, it worked with it comes, came to the pandemic and opened different hotels for people who were quarantined and all that, but looking around a little bit outside our borders, some of the messaging that he's given to Hamas in Gaza, some of what's been going on in Syria to move Iran out of Syria, you know, there's still things happening, even while we're all isolated. There's a whole lot of things happening out there. And in keeping, you know, an eye on that, um, I think he's done a very good job. And so uh, it bothers me that um, looks like for personal reasons, they're not going to get ministries that would give them the ability to do things for the people that I, I think they're capable of doing. On the other hand, um, if we really are going forward with the deal of the century or, you know, in the next few weeks or finally putting Israeli law on the Jordan Valley and in certain, you know, in the different communities in Judea and Samaria. And I understand the concerns about it saying that there will be a Palestinian state. I do. I'm not immune to that, to the dangers of recognizing that and to the dangers of counting on the so-called Palestinians to mess it up, even though I think they will. Um, because they don't think rationally and they really don't want a state. What they want is to there not be in Israel. Um, so, uh, and I, and it's like totally, totally, totally confusing. And I speak with people that I know whose opinions I respect tremendously. Uh, I've interviewed some of them on the show here, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it's not so simple. And some people think Amina should go in because this is a very important time. And the party that represents the national religious camp, if you will, uh, should be in the government when all this is happening, which is really the culmination for many of us of what we've been pushing for for many years, um, because many of us live in these communities and don't live in Israel. All right. We are not the communities themselves. The small communities are to some degree subject to Israeli law, but to a great degree aren't. Uh, Our mayor posted a few days ago that he got a visit. From, it's not a secret, he posted it, um, from the police talking about how things will change if Israeli law comes here, because right now there's a, we are really under military law, 
uh, and uh, and therefore, like car accidents and some things that you would just use uh, wouldn't even, you wouldn't even think twice about using the police or the police showing up are actually dealt with here by the army, which is not healthy for a gazillion reasons. And so how things are going to change like that. So we're feeling that there's a move towards that. And so I would like to see Amina in. Um, and even if it means taking portfolios, they're definitely designed to humiliate them to some degree because they're not the major ministries. But maybe sometimes you have to go in and just make something of it. Um, like the portfolio for Jerusalem, which they were offered. So I've been in touch with Chaim Silberstein, who, I've, who I interviewed here last year. Many of you know him, um, know about him because his daughter uh, was shot at when she was pregnant and lost her baby. And there's been all that level of it. But he is in charge of a program. He has a program called Keep Jerusalem, um, which is a different idea about what to do with Jerusalem, which is a headache in and of itself, a very worrisome survey came out yesterday that a lot of the Arabs in the eastern part of Jerusalem would now prefer to take Palestinian Authority citizenship as opposed to Israeli. And so a lot of people are concerned um, because obviously that means that they've been radicalized because everyone knows that the Palestinian Authority is not good. I mean, we're not fooling anybody. Their own people know that. Um, but uh, they had wanted Israeli, and the numbers are huge, like from more than 50% to 15%. Um, and nobody knew, even years ago, when the numbers were that they wanted to be connected more to Israel, nobody thought it was because they loved the Jewish state. It was a practical reason. They wanted access to the health care, and they wanted access to the schooling system and a lot of the benefits to be able to work in Israel. Um, so this it shows that you know, the Hamas and some of the radicals there have been working on them. And uh, so so this idea is to divide Jerusalem in different ways, though, not to divide Jerusalem the way it happened in 1948, but to divide it along the lines of the population and everybody with their own needs and everybody with their own connections to whatever sovereign will be there and their own, uh, you know, two dots of hoot, their own identity. Anyhow, that is like a whole thing. I told you today's going to be like a little, it's going to be like a smorgasbord of a show. We're just going to, we're just going to, like I said, go with how my brain is going at the moment, which is just like a total mishmash. Um, and the different things that I've been thinking about because, uh, because that's what I do all the time is think about things and, um, and how things can be made better, but also how we can find opportunity within what looks like chaos. So if they're already feeling like that and they don't want, I'm going back to the Palestinian Arabs of East Jerusalem, and they don't want Israeli citizenship, so okay. So then maybe that's a problem that we then now don't have to deal with um, because that is a concern, and we don't want to add lots of people to our citizenship roles who um, hate the state and would like to dismantle the state. That's, I I think, any country. Although you look at Europe and even the United States to some degree, hello, like, what are you doing, especially Europe? Like, don't you realize that you have created an entire class of people within your country who are trying to destroy your country? But that's not my problem. My problem is right here in Israel. And so um, maybe there's an opportunity here to go with that plan. And so maybe, I mean, uh, to get back to that, should take the Jerusalem portfolio and be able to work with that and do some little quiet work in the background and not get the the glory or the, it's not just glory that they're looking for and being a little bit snide um, because these big ministries also have bigger budgets and are, are able to wield bigger changes. So I do understand that and I am torn. Um, and so it's like, this is one of the reasons that I'm not in politics because uh, my little foray into there 20 years ago when I was a member of, for 10 years when I was a member of the local council here in Efrat, uh, gave me a nice glimpse in there, taught me a lot about how it works, and made me realize that that's not the world that I want to be in. And so, thank God, I'm in a different world, which is, or used to be, the world of tour guiding and the world of speaking. I wasn't in the best of moods, I have to admit, on Shabbat. I have to, um, and I did apologize to my husband afterwards. I mean, I wasn't like really bitchy, but I was, you know, not so happy because I was supposed to be in London at a program, um, oh, the weekend of inspiration that Mizrahi was was running um, for his Zionists in London to connect with Israel. And I'd been invited to speak there and um, and to teach also 
on Sunday. Of course, the whole thing was canceled because of the pandemic and uh, and the British and the British Jews in particular have just really been devastated. It's been horrible. Um, but it would have been great to be there and to meet new people and to bring a little bit of Israel to the UK. And so, yeah, I know it's a small thing, but my life has, has a lot of the things that really like the the plank of my life, if you will, the guiding and the traveling and the speaking, and even some of the littler things like Pilates and swimming haven't been able to do. So yeah, maybe I'm very small minded and I'm coming out of that, but it's like the rug was taken out from under me and I've had to readjust. So I have, and I bought one of those programs that they're, that they're selling all over Facebook, right? To, to exercise at home. So I bought, I don't have to give them free advertising, but I bought one of them and I've been doing some like dancing, exercising alone with the shades drawn in my den uh, because like many of you out there, so I've got, remember there was the freshman 10, so I've got the COVID five, actually two because it's so much better in kilo. So it's the COVID two. Uh, One of them has is off. The other one still needs to get off so that I get back to my fighting weight. Although yesterday I had pizza. How did I come to have pizza? Because yesterday I was out in Jerusalem and I was filming for a virtual tour, also for Mizrahi. They asked me to do one for Jerusalem Day, for Yom Yerushalayim, about the liberation of Jerusalem in the Six Day War. So not being a military historian, and also you could, I mean, you could fill you could do it like a whole mini series on that. But I decided just to focus on the paratroopers and to get more into how they liberated Jerusalem, like since I'm here, right? And a lot of the pictures and a lot of the numbers are all available, but I went from place to place. Couldn't have done this without my daughter Neely being behind the, behind the camera and filming me. So I, ju- I was jumping around Jerusalem to different places, to Ammunition Hill, where there's a the battle early on June 6th, when I say early, I mean 2.30 in the morning early, where they fought the Jordanians for four hours in a tremendously difficult battle to take over Ammunition Hill. And then from there, I went up to Mount Scopus to near Hebrew University and Hadass Hospital, so you could look down on the basin of Jerusalem from there, and because that's how they came up, and then they went along the Mount of Olives Ridge, so I went there and did a little bit of taping from there. Then I went down the hill, taping the, the ride down the hill, Um, and trying to feel how the paratroopers, I mean, how could I ever do that? That's really the height of chutzpah. But, you know, the the fear, the grief, right? They'd been fighting this war, like so many people are getting killed around them, but also the excitement and the sense of opportunity and the historical moment that's on them as they go into, they get permission to liberate the old city and they go in through Lion's Gate. So I went in, I went into Lion's Gate, um, but the the, uh, way... On King Faisal Street, that the paratroopers went in is now blocked off. Normally, you make that left into this alleyway where there's a whole lot of buildings left from the Mamelukes with the Ablak, the red and white stone. These beautiful buildings are there, but you go down an alleyway and there are these big metal gates, and then you could see through them right into the Temple Mount, and you could see the Dome of the Rock. And so normally that's how I go, and I take people around there, and we can't go in. There are border policemen who stand there and don't allow Jews to go in. They allow Muslims to go in. Now it's even worse. The gates are even shut. You can't even see into the Temple Mount. And Jews have not been allowed onto the Temple Mount since this whole pandemic began, which also means that there's a lot of mischief hap- happening there and a lot of talk about desecration of an archaeological site, the number one maybe archaeological site in the world, and that it's being desecrated. But there's also different rules in play today because we're in the month of Ramadan. Um, and so the uh, Muslims are fasting all day and eating at night. This is really their holy month. and um, we're being very considerate of that, incidentally. You know, it's interesting because um, on the one hand, it's very, very clear that the jihadists are the enemy and the people that want to take over my country are the enemy. On the other hand, I have a tremendous amount of respect for religion and uh, and for people trying to get closer to God. And there's a lot of beauty in Islam as well in terms of giving charity and that spiritual level. So there's a lot of not great things in Islam, but there's also, you know, people, there's also a lot of really good people who are, who Islam has been stolen from them to a great degree. So like going to the supermarket this week, you know, like don't go in the 
afternoon because that's where they're going to buy things so that they can go home and cook and break the fast. And, you know, I mean, as someone who we don't have a month of fasting, but we do have our fast days in Judaism and I'm not a great faster. So I know that like three, four or five o'clock on a fast day, you just have no patience and, and I get it. And especially now it's hot. So it's even worse and they're dehydrated. Um, and there's also more car accidents cause they're on the road rushing to get home from wherever they are. So, you know, there, there's a lot of that mix. And when you live here in Israel and a good part of our population is Muslim and you feel it, you know, here in Israel, we actually feel their calendar and we feel their holidays because we're living with them. And, you know, we know when there's a run on the food and we know when we should, there's going to be a lot of traffic at a certain time of day because they're trying to get home. But if you wait till after dark, when they're all sitting home eating, then the roads I'm talking about specifically now in Judea and Samaria, um, where their villages are in close proximity to ours, then you feel it in a different way. And so yesterday when I was in the old city, I also felt it um, much less, I mean, definitely, obviously less tourists, like none um, there, but also just, you know, a lot of the locals. And I was in the Muslim quarter because Lions Gate, Go is the beginning of the Via della Rosa, but it, it's the Muslim quarter. Yeah, talk about all the religions mixing up together. And there are different rules in play also for their prayers and for their being able to have their holiday the way they want to have it and much less foot traffic around. And again, that's because it was hot. It was Ramadan. So, you know, this is what's going on through my brain. And I was disappointed that I couldn't get the video that I wanted um, it, with the gates weren't open so I could really show how the paratroopers went in, so I had to pivot and do it from a higher place up in the Jewish quarter, but all the roofs were closed of the big synagogues because the big synagogues are closed, so the roof of the Chorva, which is a great place to to take a, a video or look into the Temple Mount from there, I couldn't get up there, so I did my best, and it was just great to be out and about and to be doing some form of guiding. Um, it just made me so happy. Um, and, uh, and emotional also got to the Kotel where I haven't been for quite a few weeks. And, and I've spoken about this before on the show that I'm less, uh, I, I thought until yesterday, emotionally connected to the Kotel because of some of the ideas that I have about us getting back on the Temple Mount. And that's really ground zero for for Judaism where we should be able to go and pray. And uh, that's where the temple was. And the Kotel is a supporting wall of the temple. And I think sometimes people have gone overboard when it comes to the Kotel, the Kotel, the Kotel, because we have to be careful also not to worship the stones. We go to the Kotel in order to connect with Hashem because it's the closest that we can get to where Hashem made his presence felt uh, in the world of, of the temples way long ago. Um, but I surprised myself yesterday and saw the Kotel and started to cry um, and, uh, and was happy to get back there uh, after all this time. And that kind of, I wasn't expecting that um, and said, obviously, lots of prayers there for, especially for people who are sick and that we should, humanity should come out of this pandemic and keep the good things that we have learned and and maybe change the world for the better. Maybe this is an opportunity. And I know a lot of people are talking about that. God is talking to us. He might be, but I'm not familiar with the language. I'm looking just like everybody. I'm searching for what this all means. I am by no, no way, shape, or form going to say definitively, this is the message. Because who am I to be able to say that? Um, so I'm searching for personal messages in my own life. Like maybe I needed to slow down. And so I definitely had to slow down, although I will say that I am not going to do yoga, all right? So people have always said to me over the years, well, if you only had more time, you would really love yoga. And it's like, you have to have patience. I am not going to get into yoga. If this hasn't proven it to me, then nothing will, okay? I, I love to do the downward dog, but I'm not going to do it for an hour. I'm not going to stand on my head. I do still not. I guess this is my personality and not an issue of not having time. I am not a yoga person and I find myself not even wanting to have conversations with people who are into yoga who are like so excited because all this isolation has made them better at what they're doing. And here I am like not necessarily getting better at anything that I'm doing, just trying to not slip and slide totally into the abyss. Um, so it's like, okay, uh, I know it's fine. Not happening, not in this lifetime. So we're all good to go. 
with that. But anyway, so who am I to give messages to anybody on really on anything? I'm trying to work out my own way. Um, so I was a little bit surprised at myself yesterday in a good way um, because because uh, it was good. I mean, it was just good to come back there and realize that, whoa, this is still a very, very special place. I don't worship the stones, although I have to say that going to the Kotel yesterday and touching the stones, there's definitely, and maybe because they were warm or, and worn, but there's definitely a special connection getting there, not to be worshipped, but definitely a place where you could just feel the prayers whizzing by. There is a vibe there, whatever you want to call it, that, um, that you can feel. Which is which I have felt in other places as well, and I've talked about that before. Some of my in, most intense prayer times, or where I felt like Hashem was right there, have not happened at the Kotel. They usually have to do with something happening with one of my children. Some of them have not even happened in Israel. So I uh, just I guess if you leave yourself open for the messaging, if you have the tether, as they say, like the the bandwidth on, then you will maybe. If you're lucky or if you're open to it, get those messaging. I think it's amazing for the people who are feeling that now much more than they have before. And that's a beautiful thing. If you will, a Rashbi moment, right? The seven years in isolation where he was able to get in touch with a whole other level of mystical Judaism. And that's beautiful. I'm still struggling with that. And um, I like, I'll give you another example. And I'm listening to a lot of the different podcasts, both from people on the station and not. And a lot of articles that are being written about how it's time for the Jews to come home to Israel. Um, and if this pandemic isn't giving you that message, and if the anti-Semitism that's rising, uh, rearing its ugly head, isn't giving you that message, and if the economic slowdown, um, which always, whenever there people are under stress or there's cracks in society, anti-Semitism is going to rear its ugly head. And especially in the United States or in the Western world in general, there's so much built on materialism and so much built on money. So, and civilizations tend to fall apart on what they were built on. So if there's going to be an economic slowdown or even a depression, and at this point we really aren't sure yet, I was reading yesterday some article, economic article, are we in a swoosh? Are we in like a Nike V where there's been like a little drop and then there's going to be a big going up again? And the economists, they have all kinds of different names. If you ask me, I can send you the article. If you're interested in that, exactly what's going to go on here as we recover? Are we going to recover? Is this going to be one long W of ups and downs and ups and downs? Because maybe the pandemic will come back and we'll have to isolate again. And obviously the focus here was the economy and, and what's going to happen to countries. But yes, whenever there is any kind of disruption like that, um, the Jews uh, are really at the forefront. But I'm not going to sit here and tell those of my co-religionists who are listening to this show to make Aliyah because, so don't. I mean, I happen to think that you should come and I'm here and I've put my entire life's life into this country and into raising children here and into feeling that this is the most incredible miracle and I want to be a part of it, even though it is not simple, maybe especially because it's not simple and not clear and not, and, and a lot of, you know, just to get back for a second to digress back because this is one big digressive show anyway. So getting back to Yamina and religious Zionism and have we put too much of an emphasis on the Zionism, right, on the uh, Dati Lumi. It's like, um, how would, uh, no, 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 come on, Eve, translate. Not necessarily Zionism, but, but you know, there's like the public sphere going into the army and serving the state and believing it, the state itself is unholy, but it's the beginning of, it's the beginning of the Geula, it's the, it's the Kli, it's the vessel that we have to getting to the, where the good times will roll um, and needing to be involved with that. But many of us, myself included, perhaps, put too much of an emphasis on the, that part of it, on the, you know, being a part of Israeli society and not enough of an emphasis on the Torah world. And that's why the, this, this sector that I belong to is struggling to keep our children in, involved with Torah and mitzvot. And there's a very large shift, okay, where children who are raised in religious Zionist homes have kept the Zionism, but left some of the mitzvot and some of the religious elements behind, as opposed to, let's say, the Haredi or ultra-Orthodox world, which with whatever that you want to say about them, and I don't belong to that world, and there's a lot of things that bother me about that world, but there's also a lot of things that I think are tremendous about that world, and one of them is that they are able to keep their kids involved 
in the religious sphere on a tremendous degree, much uh, much higher level than the religious Zionists, and maybe it's because they isolate them more. Okay, isolation keeps you away from certain temptations and certain things. And when you go into the army and when you go to work in the public sphere, then you will be exposed to marvelous Jews who are not necessarily keeping the mitzvot. And then it's a Jewish country, so you can just be Jewish without necessarily keeping the trappings of Judaism and Shabbat and Kashrut and the laws of family purity, something that a lot of us are struggling with in this place that I am. And so, yes, so I have devoted my life to Israel. And, but I'm not going to sit and tell people to come here because I don't, I'm not going to beg. Like if it's not obvious to you, it's not obvious to you. So don't come, you know, I know that sounds a little bit harsh, but we need you also. This is not just a a get away from the anti-Semites and run and pack your bags before you can't cross the ocean anymore. And Kristallnacht is just around the corner. And then maybe you'll get the message. And that's all quite possible because things can turn on a dime for sure. Okay. And when mayors of large cities make put out tweets that, that like just say, you know, something against one group of people, the ultra Orthodox, while other people were also having gatherings and things like that, that they shouldn't have been, but nothing said about them. That's what bothers me. You might have realized that is hypocrisy. If there's a rule for one person, one group, then there should be a rule for another. All right. So if you're going to get, get upset with people because they have been flouting the rules of social distancing, and you should, then get upset with another group of people who did the same thing. Don't just focus on one. That's what bothers me. That's what, like, we've talked about this before when it comes to Israel as well, right? So Israel is far from being a perfect country, and you're obviously welcome to criticize Israel, but then you better damn well criticize other countries that are doing the same thing or even worse, all right? So it's the double standards and the hypocrisy where you need to raise the warning bells, okay? So getting back to people making Aliyah, don't come, all right? Especially if you're praying toward about Israel and Jerusalem and you are Zionist and you're not here. Um, I, I don't understand, okay? And especially now when things are going to get worse, but I want people to come here because we also need you. Just to touch back on what I was saying, if we have a stronger <laughs> group here, a sector here that is able to balance mo- the modern world Okay, working and all that um, with a fulfilling, meaningful and rich Torah life and integrate that. And that's what's missing here uh, in the sector that I live in. And if you are able to do that outside the country, then in other countries, then come here and do it here because we need you. It's a piece that's missing here, a very big piece that's missing here. Um, and instead of sitting and complaining and saying, well, but if I move to Israel, my kids might not be religious, a very valid, incidentally, a very valid thing to say. All right. Absolutely. Because that's one of the issues that we're dealing with here is, well, I could just be Jewish and not have to be the other. So I can slip on, you know, on some of the religious things, then come here and make it better because that's the responsibility to your people. If you feel that that's the proper way to live and Israel is the country of the Jews, so then come and do it here. So I'm not going to beg you to make Aliyah. Uh, you need us. We need you. Come if you want to. I, I can't imagine living anywhere else. And I, I feel sorry for people who don't see that. Um, yesterday after doing the filming, I was with my daughter and her husband, They the ones that got married at the end of February, right before this whole thing happened, which was in retrospect, just an incredible thing. Um, and we ate pizza. I love pizza. Okay, because I had to thank her for helping me all day. I didn't have to, but I wanted to. So I treated them to pizza, and it was such good pizza. Yes, this is possibly one of the reasons <laughs> that I've lost the one kilo, but not the second. But I was really good. I had only had a fruit shake in the morning, so I had the calories saved for the pizza. Such good pizza, sourdough dough, and um, four different kinds of cheese. This wasn't like your schlock cheap pizza. I love pizza. I'll admit it. Very like definitely a food, a comfort food. And they've had onions on it and mushrooms, which are my favorite. So we had this really good pizza, but they live in, um, in the, in near the open air market, Machine Yehuda in Jerusalem. And so afterwards I went, um, I went shopping for some fruit and the apricots are out. So the last time that I was in the market, there were no apricots. The apricot season is very, very short. It's like two weeks. So even though the price is a little higher than I would like to pay, it was like 15 shekels a kilo. I guess it isn't terrible. It's not going to break the bank at this point. Even though I have no income, I think I could spring for some apricots. And uh, and they were just so beautiful. 
and, you know, reminder of that things are still growing. I can look out in my backyard. I've got a cherry tree and I have a pomegranate tree and a plum tree and the fruits are there and they're growing. Probably won't get any because the birds usually get to them way before we do because it's a whole big thing, an expensive thing to net the trees. Um, but just enjoying, enjoying the fruits. And this is the land of fruits, right? Be fruitful and multiply. But Israel is definitely the land of trees and the land of fruit. And many of our seven species are fruits, right? Five out of the seven. And so just enjoying walking around the market and the beautiful watermelons. And, and it's also getting back on its feet just a little bit. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised to see that over 90%, I would say, of people are wearing masks. So even though we're out and about on Thursday, I also I was in the Southern Hebron Hills doing some filming for video tours, for virtual video tours for the One Israel Fund. And I was in uh, at the chocolate factory in uh, the Holy Cacao factory in Malay Hever, and then went to one of the ranchers down in Ma'on and ended the day at the Drimia Winery in Susia. So it was just a beautiful day. And you can almost pretend, because I'm trying to get out a little more and do these virtual things, Almost pretend that things are back to normal, almost, but, but the truth is we still have to be careful and, and stay, you know, far from people. I'm trying, I'm really trying, but in Jerusalem I saw, and uh, I myself, except for when I was filming, was wearing a mask, um, and w- I would say even well over 90% of people, it's rare to see somebody who wasn't wearing a mask, and that was really good to see because, um, you know, this is a, like a danger time, and we want to get out, and the weather is so beautiful, and there's that springtime in the air, and um and you could the national parks are starting to reopen and they're talking about the restaurants but at least you can do takeout the pizza was takeout and um you know you just slowly 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 kind of climbing out but but people are still wary and my husband who's a physician so he's got a lot of patients coming in with a lot of anxiety um because coming out of the isolation right so there was anxiety in when we were in isolation but now that we're coming out of it there's also, there's possibly even more anxiety because now you're out in the danger zone, right? You're not going to stay in your house all the time. You got to get out, but where is it coming from? And so even though some of the schools are open, a lot of the parents, including my daughter, are not sending their kids back yet until they see what's going on, if there's going to be another outbreak, how hygienic everything is, um, you know, and still older people, like including my mother, not accepting visitors because they're really in a high risk category. So we got to, again, find that balance again, slowly, slowly moving our way out of there, but still keeping an eye on the testing and how many people are getting sick and where the, you know, the difficult zones are, let's say like the nursing homes or some of the different neighborhoods that, uh, still their numbers are too high, even though it is really, uh, unbelievable what the numbers are here in Israel and poo poo poo. And I don't want to say anything, but definitely the numbers of fatalities and every death was a tragedy for everybody around them. Uh, obviously, and that goes without saying, um, but the numbers nowhere near what we had feared them to be because of Hashem, always because of Hashem, because of good leadership that shut us down early. Obviously that's also a factor because of really, a lot of discipline when it came to the social distancing here and to stay into the isolation, um, even though obviously a lot of it was in the news, the people who didn't do what they were supposed to do, but for to a great degree um, in a society that a lot of times it considers itself undisciplined and not willing to always listen to the rules, really a lot of people did stay in their apartments or still are staying in their homes and not going out. So I'm out because I'm out, but also wearing the mask, trying to be safe, obviously can always do better hoping that I won't get sick, hoping more I think that I don't get sick, that I don't get other people sick, because that would really um, be terrible. And uh, just, you know, just so many unknowns out there. It's it's really so frightening. And we don't know about the statistics because the statistics are all over the place. If somebody died with COVID, does that mean that they died of COVID? Not the same thing. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the numbers that are out there that are being bandied about that we'll never really be able to get a handle on because no one's ever really going to know. Anyway, I think I've uh, meandered over here on a whole lot of different topics. And so I thank you for listening. Um, And I also thank you for writing. I got a lot of beautiful notes after the, especially after the Gil Hoffman interview last week, which wasn't such an easy interview. And I think, um, and, and I'm glad, especially because he's a friend and I'm glad that 
Uh, many of you appreciated the sensitivity with which we dealt with the topic of his mother's death. If you haven't heard the interview, go back and listen to it. And also love the feedback on some of the other people that I've interviewed and had here um, over the last few weeks. I really do love your feedback. I also need some advice from those of you listening, not, not just about the cord for my MacBook Air so that I can get better um, better uh, Wi-Fi and Internet quality when I do my Zooming. But um, I'm thinking of signing up for a Patreon uh, to be able to, um, if people want to, you know, give a little donation to cover the podcast, that would most definitely be appreciated. And I know that other people do that. I've been loath to do that for a while. Now I've been told that I really should. Um, and that, uh, that the content, if the content is important to you, then to be able to do that. So if anybody has suggestions, though, I already have PayPal, but they take a lot of money. They take like a high percentage. So um, I've been suggested Patreon. If any of you have advice, though, on what um, app or however it works, whatever you would call it, apps, probably not the right word, to um, to get people to donate to the podcast, that would be amazing. Um, I'm not sending you to my website as I normally do because I had the people that put my show on my website and really they take care of my website. I did have to put on unpaid leave because when I'm not guiding and not earning, so I can't afford to, to do that. Um, and I don't have the brains to be able to do it myself. So if you want to listen to old podcasts um, or be in touch with me, first of all, just be in touch with me straight, eve at the land of Israel.com. Just write to me directly. And if you want to listen to old podcasts, so go obviously into the network and, and they're all there. They're also up on SoundCloud. And, um, and if you're a new listener, then um, this was an unusual show. This you get like every six months or so when all these thoughts just build up and I spill them out. Um, usually it is an interview with somebody that I find interesting and very often find out that you also found that person interesting and that's cool. And I've got a, a list of people that uh, I'm going to be having on in the next few weeks, people whose books I've read or whatever, doing some research that I find fascinating. And, uh, and that looks like it's going to be the way that we go here in this, in this virtual world coming out through our computers, but it's more than, Rashbi had, uh, although maybe he wouldn't have written, been able to write the czar had he had all the noise coming into his cave. So, but it is what it is. And here we are in 2020, 5780 with the tools that we have and, uh, and using them and hopefully gaining from them and, and learning from them and not wasting too much time because there's also the possibility of doing that. So with much, much thanks to Ben and to Tabitha who keep this show going out. Um, and I appreciate that so much, especially as I've said, Tabitha, with a house, house full of kids, not so easy to be able to do that. And I really do appreciate uh, those who uh, enable me to get my voice out and those of you who are listening. So um, take care, everybody. All right. Get well, stay well, whatever it takes. We're all going to get through this somehow apart, but together. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network, broadcasting on Lagba Omer from a smoke, under a smoke-free sky. I once landed in Israel on Lagba Omer, and it was like actually landed through a cloud of smoke. So very nice to not have that today. Um, remember planes? When we used to land? Yeah, airplanes, right, travel. Ah, we'll get back to it one day and hopefully to a better world. So really take care, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. So much appreciated. 